and there will be okay there will be an announcement <laughs> so i can see people are still joining us but i think it's better to begin uh, promptly as this um, i think i can see is a widely attended event quite packed so we will probably need every minute of it um, I am Diana Georgescu and I'm a professor of Romanian and Southeast European history here at the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies at UCL. And I'm extremely honored to introduce for you Professor Maria Todorova, who will speak today about her most recent book, which was published uh, by Bloomsbury Academic, only a stone's throw away from the physical UCL in central London in 2020. So here we are a year later, turning the pandemic to good use by having this virtual book launch, talk about the book that sort of compresses space. I think there are people joining us from um, a couple of continents, which is why I avoid saying either good afternoon or good morning. Um, and this allows us to, to have this worldwide audience for the talk, which will be followed by a question and answer session. So it is true that Maria Todorova does not really need an introduction, but she will get one today for the sake of our audience. Uh, Professor Todorova is Edward William and Jane Margotsville Professor of History at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, which thanks to her has become a Mecca of Balkan and Eastern European studies for postgraduate students over the past few decades. As a prolific historian of the Balkans, Professor Todorova is the author of many monographs, edited volumes, and over, I think I counted over 200 articles and book chapters. Her work is characterized by this combination of rigorous, historically specific study and engagement with broader methodological and theoretical questions that often uh, resonate well beyond the Balkans or South Southeast European studies. We, of course, all know her as the author of Imagining the Balkans from 1997, a work which has become an international bestseller. Uh, it, I think, was translated in about 13 languages, including um, Romanian, you know, so including even countries that reject the, the label of Balkan. And it's continuing to provide the paradigm for our field. Um, it is the work that introduces my students to the study of the Balkans and the discourse of Balkanism. Most recently, in 2009, Professor Todorova's monograph, Bones of Contention, The Living Archive of Vasil Levski and the Making of Bulgaria's National Hero, explored weak nationalisms, the construction of national heroes and memory. And aspects of this production of national identity and history are similarly addressed in her work, um, her edited volume, Balkan Identities, Nation and Memory from 2004. And of course, those familiar with uh, Maria's work over the past decade or so also know her as an untiring editor in the field of post-socialist memory, with the two volumes on remembering communism and uh, one on post-socialist nostalgia co-edited uh, with Zsuzsa Gile in 2010. With this latest book, Professor Todorova turns to a new research interest, the period of the Second International, the golden age of the socialist idea, which she, to use her own uh, term, recalibrates through the lens of the Bulgarian socialist movement. And this approach allows the author to engage with a broader set of questions, amongst which the relation between core and periphery, which is something that resonates with our interests here at the Fringe and Southeast European Seminar Centers. Um, and it, um, in reading some reviews of the book, I noticed our own Wendy Bracewell welcomed it to quote as a triumphant vindication of the historian's view from the periphery. So with this, I will um, give the floor or maybe the screen to Professor Todorova, who will introduce us to her book, The Lost World of Socialists at Europe's Margins, Imagining Utopia, 1870s to 1920s. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for initiating and organizing and advertising this so successfully. And thank you to all uh, to all of you for your interest. Uh, while discussing with uh, with Diana uh, the format of this uh, of this meeting, whether it should be uh, a seminar or a lecture, we decided in favor of a lecture. And uh, still, I want to apologize to the ones who may have already read the book and uh, who find that a lecture is redundant. Uh, but I would be very happy to engage with questions and also uh, in personal correspondence with whoever would like uh, after the talk. So at this point, let me share my screen.
Is that, can you see that? Yeah, we can see yes. it. Yes, excellent. So uh, I would like to give you an idea of how and why the book was crafted the way it was. So let me begin uh, with the title. Titles are a battleground, as most of you know, between publishers and authors. My initial one was Living Utopia, which I meant to live one's utopia, but I could not insist on the use of living as a verb without at the same time acknowledging its alter alternate reading as an adjective, implying an actualized utopia, and that would have overshadowed the human subjects of my work. The publishers insisted that my subtitle would be the main title, title because it has all the useful keywords, and so it is in the catalogs, but I still managed to highlight it in my cover. And on the left, you see my uh, cover. But why imagine? It is a thoroughly opposite concept, and I very much admired the recent volume, Socialist Imaginations, but I shied away from imagining first because of the burden of imagining the Balkans, which I'm afraid will haunt me until my end. At the same time, settling on imagining gave me the opportunity to disentangle the meanings and reflect on the trajectory of my own work from the Balkans to Utopia. Distinguishing between the projects should not obscure the similarities, however. Imagining the Balkans was incubated within resentment against the ghettoization of the region and a sense of ethical outrage against the debilitating effects of discursive essentializations but it operated on the level of a meta discourse, historicizing and problematizing the discursive practices that generated and reproduced understandings of the Balkans. Individual contributions within such an approach are do accrete, but they disappear within a structural framework. The last chapter on Realia notwithstanding, the work's power is its discursive analysis exegesis. The excavation, on the other hand, uh, of the lives of early socialists is a similarly motivated emancipatory project, which at its most inductive limit problematizes generalized ideological descriptions that rely on the erasure of the uh, liminal. Yet in between these projects, there is another theme that has preoccupied my thinking in the last decade, namely the concept of scaling. Within this work, discursive imagination is individualized. The top-down examination of interpolation to the individual level is reversed in favor of individual close-ups, emphasizing how thought emotion, and I think of it as a, uh, as a unitary uh, concept, shapes one's individual agency in turn contributing to the habitus of utopia. This grounding in individuals in the scale of the particular is a methodology that provides a constant remind, a reminder against inference uh, and, um, uh, and termino terminological slippage. It highlights multiplicity and dissonance. It allows to sweep away the generalizing hegemony of the dominant and showcase the significance of the liminal on a regional, social, and individual level. It also argues for a creative dialogue with the liminal in which it often has constitutive power. So let me begin with this New Year's card, which is of course the basis for the, uh, for the, the original basis for the cover. And the only change here is that original card had Marx, uh, Babel and LaSalle and we substituted LaSalle for Rosa Luxemburg. Uh, so uh, this New Year's card is, uh, executed in the fashionable uh, Jugendstil of the time. The allegory of the three graces has been known since antiquity when they depicted beauty, charm, and grace, but by the beginning of the 20th century, it had passed through its Christian hypothesis of faith, hope, and charity to personify the symbols of the French Revolution, liberty, um, uh, fraternity, and, uh, uh, and equality. Um, the card was sent in December 1910 by one 14-year-old girl to another 14-year-old girl in the village of Optilare. Writing at the close of the 20th century, Jacques Attali lamented that the French Revolution is a sequence of failed utopias. But at the beginning of the century, these utopias were very much alive and they inspired young girls of 14. 
it inspired, if inspired by the dominant Marxism, they would not call their dreams utopias. But of course, Marxism, which liked to think of, it, of itself as non-utopian, was itself utopia presented under the guise of anti-utopia. The addressee of the New Year's card wrote later, and I quote, and this is the, the girl to whom uh, this was sent. I don't remember what we read, but we considered ourselves socialists. I only recall that the following year when the teacher in Bulgaria assigned to us an essay about a great personality in world history, Stanka wrote about Karl Marx and I wrote about Wilhelm Liebknecht. By then, I had already liberated myself from religion and demonstrated it openly, end quote. My goal here is to recuperate the appeal of the socialist ideology and the utopia implicit in it. I'm doing this by going back to the experience of people who thought and dreamt of utopia and struggled to achieve it. No matter how they called their dreams, liberty, equality, fraternity, justice, happiness, hope, socialism, communism, social democracy, the important thing is that they were involved in a movement which worked toward their ideal. Using different scales of observation, I shift the focus from aerial views uh, of large scale uh, movements uh, or, or, or ideas to closer pictures of group characteristics and finally to close up of individuals. In the politically correct academic parlance, I would say that this one is top down but transnational. This uses digital humanities and this is national but bottom up. My centers and peripheries. Um, this focuses on the intersection between center and periphery by looking at the history of social democracy from the positive margins of Europe. And I'm really happy to share this motto because uh, I was not allowed to use it by Bloomsbury because the Dalai Lama is alive. So I had to resort to someone who was dead in the last uh, almost 3000 years. Chronologically, I'm restricting it roughly to the half century of what Kowakowski uh, termed the golden age of social democracy from the 1870s to the 1920s. Utopian visions and emancipatory movements were obviously not restricted to socialism and I deal with some of them. But Marxist socialism, especially with the second international was hegemonic. I end with the aftermath of the October Revolution, not because I want to gloss over, let alone smear the interwar period of communism by insisting that it had an earlier and nobler, less militant prehistory. This would be an entirely different and non-historical stance displaying little sensitivity to the specifics and to the contingencies of the historical moments. I do think, however, that there is a qualitative difference between a utopia of the future and a utopia on earth. And it has to do uh, with the effects of generational shifts, encompassing everything from approximate demographic clusters and specific social habitus to the consequences of singular dramatic events serving as a rupture such, such as the uh, Great War and especially the Bolshevik Revolution, which for its followers had actualized their utopia. The future was no longer desirable and nebulous. It had just arrived and had to be defended. In this part, I challenge the established typology of two modes of socialism, Western and, uh, Europe and Eastern. I'm doing it through an exercise in Begriffsgeschichte of the common history of socialism, communism, and Marxism. In so far as we can speak of a binary model, it would be applicable only after the 1920s with a schism that occurred uh, after the creation of the Third International in 1919 and the developments in the interwar period. But it was semantically crystallized only after the Second World War by Merleau-Ponty. The passionate debates within the Second International were not played on a West-East axis. The selection of the European periphery as the space of my account is not simply because it is less known, and it is less known, but because I hope to fracture and recalibrate the dominant narrative, which is confined to Western Europe and insists on the exclusive authenticity of industrial development and working class milieu, questioning 
uh, at the same time, the, uh, the uh, validity and credibility of socialism, socialism spread in, uh, in a rural milieu uh, in, in countries with an incipient proletariat. And here uh, I'm, I'm giving you uh, the uh, example of the uh, 1912 elections in, will, in which social democratic parties won 7% in industrial Britain, 16 in France, 18 in the Netherlands, <clears throat> Bulgaria, Italy, and Belgium, over 20%, industrial Germany, 34, and rural Finland, trumping Germany with 43%. I then situate Bulgaria, uh, Bulgarian socialists, uh, uh, I then choose, of course, uh, the Bulgaria, uh, which, which had one of the largest, if not uh, uh, the largest and mo most influential social democratic uh, movements in clearly the Balkans, but also Eastern Europe, which, which had a unique relationship both to German and to, uh, oh here, uh, to German and to Russian uh, social democracy. And here you see the two gods um, of, uh, Bulgarian social democracy, Kautsky and uh, Plekhanov. Uh, here are the two leaders of the Bulgarian social democratic movement. And this is the Geneva uh, group. Uh, you have Georgi Bakalov, Svian Nokov, Christian Rakovsky here with his uh, close friend uh, Trotsky, his Russian wife, Elizaveta Ryabova, who died in uh, uh, childbirth, and uh, Slavi Balabanov. So, uh, I situate uh, uh, Bulgarian uh, social democracy within this bickering, but still family formation of social democracy and demonstrate how this problematizes the notion of transfer of ideas. And here you can see uh, this, uh, uh, the numbers of translations in Bulgaria, who, which trump uh, clearly uh, uh, translations and publications in other countries. Uh, it is, is it not a sublime irony that the universalist Marx, no matter how we deconstruct his uh, universalist claims, has to be nationalized for Germany or regionalized for Western Europe, where he's deemed authentic and transferred to the rest of Europe and the world? Why is thus a, this a West-East transfer when these ideas were equally transmitted to the West European intellectuals and working classes through a popularizing and often reductionist propaganda? One never speaks of the transfer of Marxism in France, although it never took deep roots in the country, or in England, where it was technically conceived, but was never popular in the labor movement. Even in the German context, where it became the official doctrine, it had to be transmitted and imposed. It also had to be translated from German into German in a more accessible language by a whole troop of Marxian exegetes. Uh, exegetes. Uh, of course, Kautsky being uh, the premier, but also uh, Mehring and others. Let me now uh, offer a detail from this part. Uh, here is Kautsky, of course, <clears throat> and this is the second man uh, in the uh, Bulgarian Social Democratic Party Neros, Georgi Kirkov in 1903. And here he is as a young man in 1887, just finishing high school and on his way as a student in the Vienna Cartographic Institute. In February 1917, at the height uh, of the war, Kirkov sent Kautsky, the leader of the Second International, the so-called Red Pope, uh, on, and I quote, on the part of our comrades here, a modest gift that could be useful in the present circumstances, namely 100 eggs and some other things to eat, end quote. The next much longer letter was from March 1917 after Kautsky had gratefully acknowledged receipt of the eggs. I'm happy, he wrote, that I could contribute through my modest gift to the material basis of your world of ideas, especially now when the international proletariat brought to confusion by the events, betrayed and almost without leadership, needs urgently the bold, committed, and above all, consistent word of its old, trusted, and faithful master and leader." End quote. Now, if the tease in this sentence can be taken for a doctrinaire recitation of historian, uh, historical materialism, one should be disabused. Kirchhoff was celebrated for his inimical sense of humor. Twice ele elected to parliament, his speeches were so popular that the MPs of the governing parties came to listen to him because of his wit. 
uh, the redoubtable journalist and diplomat Simeon Radev wrote, I quote, never has a socialist suggested suicide to the bourgeoisie in such a pleasant manner like citizen Kirko, end quote. Responding to, Kirk, uh, to Kautsky's comment, uh, comment that the February Russian Revolution would speed up the end of the war, Kirchhoff reminded that the German proletariat entered the war under the sign against Russian Tsarism. And he says, now that the Russian proletariat has brought down Tsarism, the question is, what should the attitude of the German proletariat be, since the position of the backbone of reaction has been ceded to the German monarchy? It seems that the Ger that German monarchism was stronger and thus more dangerous for socialism and democracy than the Russian. Now, just to remind you here, the Bulgarian Narrows were one of a tiny but honorable foursome alongside the Serbian and Italian social democrats and the left coalition in the Russian Duma who consistently opposed the war and voted against the war credits, only these four. The letter ended with Kirko's hopes that the German proletariat will rise, rise to, his, uh, to its task. Immediately following was a postscriptum, and I quote it. This letter will be passed to you by Comrade Michov, who is, he also is going to hand you 150 eggs. And would you please kindly give 50 of them to Comrade Rosa Luxemburg and Comrade Karl Liebknecht, together with the warmest greetings of the Bulgarian comrades, end quote. Thus, the whole correspondence, despite the serious issues discussed, was tactfully bookended not by reproach, but by eggs, of which only 10 arrived broken. But there is an organic relationship between things and practices. Eggs have always been considered one of the most nutritional foods and in poor societies, a rare and coveted ingredient on a festive table. Alongside meat and butter, eggs were considered, if not a remedy, at least providing and strengthening resistance to tuberculosis, which, uh, which was, of course, the mal du siècle. In times of war especially, but also during peacetime, it was common for rural relatives to send eggs to their city kin, usually reserved for children as a strong preventive nutrient. Ironically, by sending eggs to their German comrades, the Bulgarian socialists were playing the role of the rural relatives and were reproducing their country's status as agricultural su uh, supplier to the industrial German center. Now, what does this survey of the place of Bulgarian social democracy leave us with? Does it upset the history of socialism? Is there an East European or Balkan contribu contribution to it? What is the price of excising the periphery? Uh, I'm offering here several conclusions. First, it questions the stereotype about how Marxism in peripheral societies, especially agrarian societies with a weak working class has been formed. And for this, we don't necessarily have to wait for the discovery of the third world and post-colonial theory to show that this is not paradoxical, but possible and normal. Where the Balkans are evocative is that they show this alternative not in line with the argument of different paths to modernity in different spaces and different time periods, but synchronically and within the same space. The Balkans, despite the condescensions, have hardly been questioned as a European space and their path to modernity has been described as lagging, but not systemically different. Theoretically, of course, the Russian example, which has been more studied and to which Western historians pay more attention, should be sufficient. Yet in practice with Russia, there is always the fallback to deviation because it is often described and unfortunately also self-described as essentially non-European, really different. And because Western Marxism has excised it neatly and now with a new Cold War, it is difficult to serve as a foil. But Bulgaria can. Its inclusion fractured, fractures the normative story about socialism from within. Secondly, uh, and this is a picture of the uh, first Balkan socialist uh, conference, and in the middle you see Blagoev on his uh, uh, right or his left 
uh, is uh, Dimitri Tutsovich, and I don't know the others, if you can help me identify them. Uh, there were delegates from Austria-Hungary, from uh, uh, Croatia, Slovenia, and Bosnia, and uh, the Ottoman Empire was, uh, uh, had, uh, had the uh, Armenians, the uh, Hunchakian uh, party. Um, so, uh, secondly, if rare and not entirely reciprocal, the narrative shows intersections and intercrossing of ideas. To imply that Balkan socialists contributed to the theory of socialism uh, with their take on the Balkan federative idea might seem overstated because it was not acknowledged. Yet no other theoretical attempt of Marxism in the sphere of nationalism has uh, endured and borne any fruit. In actuality, the detailed deliberations of the Bulgarian socialists creating a federative structure beginning with a customs union and preserving independent territorial entities was original and ran against the predominant views, mostly Austro-Marxism, which too was unsuccessful in the end. Thirdly, this analysis addresses the challenging problem of historical signific significance. This, of course, is a philosophical question, and historians notoriously avoid it because they, they, they choose the significant items with which to weave their explanatory narrative. Altogether, they assign importance in terms of causal uh, significance, but they often forget that causality, assigning causality itself is a, uh, is a sign of value orientation, and of course, it's Max Weber who reminds us of this. Another Weber, Eugene Weber may, may have been right when he said, and I quote him, history is the tale of what happened, not of what might have happened. And that does a great deal to narrow our field, end quote. But what do we do when it actually did happen? And we choose not to write about it because we decide that it is not representative or typical or significant. By excising these parts, we pay a price both epistemologically and ethically. We should be thinking of the international and socialism at large as an intersection in time where different outlooks meet, held together by a shared worldview, a polyphonic contrapuntal chorale. It is only normal and sometimes inbuilt that we hear a not dominant voice. It may even have a solo part, but the other voices make a difference. Do they change the melody? Hardly. But they change the rhythm, the harmony, and how we hear it. And the difference is that between a Gregorian chant and Bach. So part two, generations, addresses the intersection uh, or interplay of several generations of leftists, looking at the specifics of how socialist ideas were generated, received, transferred, and transformed. This period and its agents remain relatively unknown, even in the local historiography. I offer three ways of uh, approaching groups. First, there is a quantitative um, uh, uh, analysis, prosopographical analysis of several demographic cohorts unified in a specific political generation. It is based on the digitized database of over uh, 3,500 individuals, harnessing material from the existing biographical dictionaries, encyclopedias, published sources, documents, and archives. And maybe I should just uh, open a parenthesis here. This is not a book I wanted to research uh, and was looking for sources. The sources were staring at me and wanted wanted me to write about them. While working in Sofia uh, in the archives on a completely different project, I came across an obscure catalog from the former Party Institute listing over 4,000 files of memoirs counting over 130,000 pages in some 250 boxes across 40 linear meters. So the database includes first and foremost self-defined uh, defined social democrats of different, of, of often passionately opposed factions, but also anarchists, anarcho-liberals, populists, narodniks, left-wing agrarians, left-wing members of different nationalist organizations. 
it uh, allows to establish patterns about social provenance, types of place of education, professional and political networks, involvement in crucial events, and so on. So I will walk you very briefly uh, here uh, through some of the results, only some. Uh, this table shows the exponential growth of the party after its creation. Um, it, it's the same table, but in a different uh, a mode. Uh, this table illustrates what was known and produced unease among the socialists, namely that this was a party predominantly of intellectuals, or at least of the educated class. Uh, the place of intellectuals in a social group was a question that bothered not only Bulgarian socialists, and it has remained an open question until today. In the relatively egalitarian Bulgarian society of the 19th century, but especially in the more dynamic atmosphere of the newly created and modernizing state, education was a most valued cultural capital and the principal meritocratic means of, for advancement. So there are only around 600 individuals with a definite educational record, and of them, 541 have university education. Um, this, this table shows the overwhelming proportion of lawyers. Uh, and that's unexpected result, but it was explained rather nicely in one of the memoirs, and I quote, the law profession is independent. That is, it is materially independent from the direct control of the state. Lawyers cannot be fired. They can be deprived of their rights only under exceptional circumstances anticipated in law. This guaranteed lawyers not only their material existence, but allowed them to undertake social and specifically political work. Every idealist intellectual who in the past desired to devote himself to social work wanted to study law and become a lawyer. This naturally did not mean that only idealists became lawyers. Many bourgeois politicians and political careerists chose this path, end quote. Um, their education, the education of these uh, um, university graduates, they received both in Sofia in Bulgaria, but mostly abroad and mostly in Western Europe. And here you see mostly Switzerland, but also Germany, Austria, France, and the others all Western Europe. Um, and this is of course uh, only uh, after, uh, after, uh, after my period. Um, so in any case, this among others puts to rest the theory of the exclusive Russian educational and ideological background of socialists, which I'm addressing in the book but not here, without in any way denying the immense role of personal and cultural uh, ties to Russia. My analysis then moves to a qualitative account um, where uh, I'm just giving you this uh, and I will come back to this uh, uh, slide. Um, where representative cases are singled out to create a narrative around the notion of formation or building. All in all, the pattern for the earliest socialists was starting with emancipatory nationalism, then becoming quickly disappointed by, by it, enamored by the promise of science, especially biology and physics, and looking for a scientific explanation of social affairs, which they easily found in Marxism. The younger ones were socialized mostly in the gymnasium, that is the high school, but the individual ways are very diverse. Here I'm addressing also the different socialisms and the different Marxisms within this movement. Finally, I try to shed light on the invisible women of the movement by questioning the opposition between socialist women and socialist wives. I'm especially intrigued by how early socialists ap uh, approached gender issues, how they dealt with the conundrum of professed ideas of equality, but practice it in a society of unequal footing. And here you see the 10th party Congress, and this is the sole woman in the end, a remarkable woman, Anna Stefano, who did not even make it to a single encyclopedia. I'm giving short shrift to this chapter in my oral presentation, but because I want to get over to the, uh, to the individual uh, uh, cases, but suffice it to say that socialist women, socialist women and socialist wives should not be seen as a contradiction in terms. Socialist men could afford to be leading and visible, 
because of their invisible socialist wives, that they, and also some socialist women, were very seldom acknowledged this, says less of the limitations of the socialist idea and more of the rootedness of these men and women in their historical time and space. Luckily, many women have been preserved visually, even if we don't know their names. If part one looked in the world from above, seeing it somewhat flat but whole, and part two came closer and distinguished between how how high, high mountains and the deep sea, part three is in medias res, catching not only noises but sighs and smells. Structures of feeling focuses the lens on individual experience. It investigates the intersection between subjectivity and memory as reflected but also inflected by published and unpublished memoirs, diaries, personal correspondence, biographies and autobiographies, oral interviews, all of which allow the reconstruction of the world of the first socialist generation. It introduces several unknown biographies by highlighting their emotional world of an extraordinary peasant teacher, Angelina Boneva, of a lawyer who also happened to be a love-stricken graphomaniac and of a brilliant economist and bank director and his no less stunning partner. In doing this, I want to pick up and resurrect what has been considered historical debris and serve as the transmitter, translator of human visions and emotions. As formulated in one of my favorite uh, book novels, Julian Barnes's uh, The Sense of Ending, History is that certainty produced at the point where the imperfections of memory meet the inadequacies of documentation. I start with Angelina Boneva, who does not exist again in any encyclopedia. I first encountered her mentioned in an episode that was narrated in a small aside under the title Curiosity, uh, in the unpublished memoirs of a provincial teacher and lifelong social democrat. He was recalling how in a gray autumn uh, of 1911, he was sitting with the owner of a small bookstore in the town of Vratza, uh, which sold Marxist literature and uh, was a virtual club for socialists. An old peasant woman entered the bookstore. She was dressed all in black with a black kerchief over her white hair. She wore simple peasant men's shoes and instead of a bag had a wicker basket. Once she entered the bookstore, she reached into her bosom and produced a small cigarette case. Then she rolled a cigarette, took out a pair of glasses and started looking at the literature. The owner approached her pointing to the way out. Grandmother, we don't have the books you're looking for. I know you're trying to find the dreams of the Virgin or a stone fell from heaven. The peasant woman pretended not to have heard him and continued to look at the books. Finally, she asked, do you have anti During? The owner Popeye stared at her. She continued unruffled by asking him whether he, uh, he had Kautsky and named a particular book. She finished her cigarette, picked silently the, a few other books and calmly said, the bill please. Angelina Boneva uh, was the oldest teacher in Bulgaria <clears throat> in the village of Pripoljene in her mid sixties and was a devoted member of the social democratic teachers organization. Once a month, she would take the seven kilometer road on foot to town to attend a meeting of the organization. All my efforts to find something more about her at the time I read this excerpt were in vain. Much later and by sheer luck, I uh, discovered a file on her in a small uh, provincial archive. So we are lucky of course, uh, to have this small voice of uh, history in definition of uh, Ranajit Guha. So you see her here at the age of 32. That, this is the only picture that exists of her. Uh, and this is a passport thing uh, of 32, of, uh, of 70 and of 82. And this is how she entered the, the bookstore. The file contains reminiscences about Angelina by her former students and colleagues collected during her 80th birthday in 1930 and at the centenary of the school in 1950. There is an official school book at the school of the village in her own uh, handwriting, here it is. Finally, there are her own memoirs copied by her nephew. These are strange memoirs, apparently conceived as notes for a future unfinished autobiography, but not ensuing 
from uh, a, pre a preliminary structured plan and obviously following stream of consciousness. Angelina was born in 1852. Being the youngest child in an orphan family, she was sent uh, to work in the fields and not allowed to, uh, to attend school. At the age of 23, trying to avoid being married by her brothers, she, uh, and completely illiterate, uh, but with a strong desire to learn, she ran away from home. She completed her elementary school education, four grades, in two years in the town of Pirot, at that time still in the Ottoman Empire, and then moved to Sofia, already in uh, independent uh, autonomous Bulgaria, studied for another five years, coming out with a pedagogical degree. As a teacher, she became a member of the IMBRO and participated actively in the Macedonian struggle. Arrested by the uh, Ottoman police and later amnesty, she returned to Bulgaria where, we, where she taught until 1922, when she was retired against her will at the age of 70. And here you can, you can see in her own small handwriting, she copies, uh, she copies the uh, letter notifying her of her, of, of, her, of her retirement and adds uh, a line in here in, in her minuscule um, handwriting, and this is what she uh, adds, Miji Asan Datibayam, which is a dialectal phrase, uh, literally meaning, close your eyes, Hassan, uh, I will mumble an incantation, essentially meaning, give me a break. Uh, so later on in 1925, an, an inspector looked at the school book and put a question mark behind the phrase, behind the phrase and uh, adding in a pencil, such ironies cannot be allowed in official books. Angelina Boniva seemed to have had the last uh, laugh. An open uh, Communist Party member, she continued her political engagement after the party was banned until her death in 1938 at the age of 86. For me, the interesting juxtaposition was between how she was remembered and how she remembers. There is a fundamental factual agreement between the recollections about and of her. And yet there are significant differences between style, tone, and emphasis in describing her public and private persona. The public one has three vectors, teacher, patriot, and socialist. Without denying these, the private one uh, deals only with the first, elaborately, uh, elaborated mostly in the official school book. The second is mentioned only implicitly, and the third, not at all. Although, of course, there is no doubt about her uh, political uh, engagement. Why is that? Was she writing strictly for herself? Here I'm using Paul Ricoeur's notion of idem and ipse identity, sameness, answering the question, what am I? And selfhood, answering, who am I? What Angelina Boneva was is what she projected with her physical presence, character, and actions, and how this was reflected in the eyes of others, but also how she recognized herself as an individual, teacher, patriot, and socialist. But who she was emerges from how she shaped the story of herself in her notebooks, which focus excessively on her childhood. Behind the self-assured teacher lurks a traumatized child. It is not merely that she put down information that she had not shared, but remembering different episodes, she created a narrative identity that further helped her to better understand herself. The human need of making oneself intelligible to oneself ultimately equals composing one's own life. In the, in the words of Repair, and I quote, self-understanding is an interpretation and finds in the narrative a privileged form of, med of uh, mediation, end quote. Was Angelina Bonneva an exception? Certainly not as a female teacher and not as a socialist female teacher either. There were many of them, but mostly they were seen and seeing themselves as the outside urban modernizer. What raised the eyebrows of the men who witnessed her visit to the bookstore was her appearance of a typically peasant woman. She did not stand out from her village environment. The people who celebrated her treated her not as an exception, but as an inspiration, as a role model. Was she then typical or representative of some group so that one can infer some co common characteristics? I'm inclined to, uh, to answer defensively that it doesn't matter. 
why do we apply, uh, apply the criterion of typicality only to ordinary people? Why are they only subjected to the statistical eye? Do we speak about the untypicality of presidents, generals, princes? I would like to think of her as an extraordinary, ordinary person. I'm coming now to uh, the diary of Todor Tsekov, my uh, graphomaniac lawyer, who produced 10 volumes of handwritten diaries of which only the first four were given to the archives after his death by his family. They covered his life from his birth in 1882 uh, with diary entries between 1904 until 1932, comprising more than 1,000, uh, 1,200 pages. Tsekhov emigrated twice to the United States where he received his law degree and his wife uh, received an MA in biology from uh, St. Louis. Uh, and he organized the Bulgarian social democratic uh, groups and edited their newspaper uh, right here outside in uh, Illinois. Um, given the inclusion of lengthy excerpts from the diaries and whole letters, the whole exercise looks more like a montage of sources, an ed memoir. If autobiography is life construction through text construction, uh, Tsekhov's uh, material is a hybrid memoirs diary approaching the confessional genre. It is dominated by his devotion to socialism and his love affairs. And let me quote, I was taken by the love scenes in the books I read and cried over the sorrows of young Werther. I was already 18 years old, completely devoted to nature, entertainment, reading and patriotism, but my sexual life was in a lethargic state, end quote. He sent 300 letters in the year that he was in military school and kept copies of all of them. The longest 160 page was to one of his girlfriends. Uh, he had sub subscribed her to uh, an array of socialist uh, uh, publications and she left him. Uh, now ideas and love alternate on the same page, often in the same sentence, and we have a detailed picture of his intellectual and physical cravings. And I quote, and this is on this page. I too want to have, to I too want to love, but a woman pure of debauchery, who is not a hypocrite, Far from meaning, far from meanness and, and deception, who despises coquetry and directs her thoughts to the realization of a new social order. I want a woman whose ideas are superior to her feelings, and only then, backed by ideals, shall we be able to lead a completely happy life. Only a woman with a progressive spirit can be a true companion to men. And the end of this, he added in large letters. I had a pollution and was very excited. So this brings me uh, to my last uh, vignette, if you like. Uh, here are Koike Tineva and Nikola Sakharov as students in Berlin in 1903, among a group of Bulgarian young socialists of which Sakharov was the secretary. Here is Sakharov. Uh, she's sitting on the far uh, right and Nikola Sakharov, her future husband, is standing behind her with his hand over her shoulder. Both are wearing uh, pince-nez, uh, which was not a sign of uh, affectation since in all their later photographs, they need their glasses. Next to Sakharov in the middle is another Nikola, uh, Nikola Harlakov, Koika's future life partner. So with hindsight, uh, this is a picture of a future love triangle. Married in 1906, uh, Koika left Sakharov for Harlakov in 1911, although uh, the official divorce came only in 1922. All three of them participated in different socialist formations. First the Narrows, then the Anarcho-Liberals, then the Broads, then back to the Narrows, then Communists, and then uh, out of the movement. Uh, after 1925, Sakharov retreated from political commitment, although he continued to be socially engaged. Koika Tineva, on the other hand, had emigrated to the Soviet Union and was arrested after her uncle, Christio or Christian Rakovsky, the commissar of the Ukraine and later Soviet ambassador to London and Paris, was shot as a Trotskyite in 1941. As behooves intellectuals, 
uh, both were reserved in their feelings, although both, uh, but especially Sakharov, left a prodigious uh, written legacy, mostly uh, books in economics. Um, they were a studious couple, but not excessively stern and humorless. So here is a photograph of, the, as them, uh, of them as newlyweds, uh, and they are dressed up as, uh, as Turks. This is from a studio in, is in Istanbul. Um, and uh, reclining, uh, of course, on an, uh, on an ottoman and with a hookah in front. And this is the only photograph of Koika without her uh, pince nez. Were it not for one item in Sakharov's archive that was luckily deposited alongside the hundreds of pages describing his political views and dozens of books and uh, articles on economic and social issues, one would uh, remain with the impression that here you have uh, an extremely thoughtful, upright and disciplined human being, completely in control of his emotions, even to the point of suppressing them. One would then perhaps dare speculate about the reasons Koika left him for the dashing Harlako. But this item certainly belies any hasty supposition of lack of emotion or even inability to express it. Uh, it is a small handmade, uh, a handmade little album stemming from Nicola's Berlin student ears. It's eight by 10 centimeters with pressed flowers. Um, half the pages are in in German with uh, poems by Heinrich Heine and the other half with entries in Bulgarian about the meaning of love. Nicola and Koike were speaking the language of European high culture in its main vernaculars of the time, French and German, and sharing in its main sensibilities and perhaps also affectations. Sentimentality was the twin of the socialist sentiment. Let me begin to conclude. Most of the lives I was trying to recover from oblivion were inspired by a utopia of the future and were attempting to live their lives according to its ideals. In so far as they conformed to these ideals, one can simply define them as idealist. Many of the older ones among the political generation completed their voyage to life in the interwar years, before the advent of uh, utopia on Earth. Many, especially among the younger generation, born after the turn of the century, who grew up in the interwar period, gave their lives for it. Others survived and tested the utopia of state socialism. Again, some were persuaded by it, where others were disappointed and paid with their lives. Still others reserved a skepticism toward the praxis, but preserved their belief in the ideal. By confining my narrative and analysis to the generation born before, uh, before 1900, I want again to emphasize that I'm not passing judgment on how they conducted their lives, and least of all posit that there existed a liberal, tolerant, legal socialist, uh, which were dis who were displaced by intolerant and terrorist communists. My socialists were imagining a world in which they wanted to live. For at the same time as one speaks of discursive frameworks being imagined, of a socialist imagination of think-feel, one necessarily has to account for the fact that for the Marxist among the socialists especially, socialism was not utopia. Even someone like Kolakowski, who was adamant about the desirable demise of utopia and fiercely critical of Marxism, still left open the door for socialism. I end my book on a personal note, and I'm, I'm going to do it here. Some 40 years ago, when I lived under real socialism in Bulgaria, but especially after the crushing of the Prague Spring in 1968, I was taking seriously Max Weber's much cited adage from 1919 that the audacious Russian experiment would bereave socialism of its reputation and authority for 100 years. Whether Weber's dictum was borne out by reality can be a matter of debate. But coming from someone who disliked and feared socialism, he pointed out its pivotal role as a social alternative in Europe before the First World War. Weber died in 1920 and could not foresee the peregrinations of socialism and witness the different moments at which believers adopted, and adopted his doubts. 
1925, 1937, 1949, 1953, 1956, for me, 1968. Later, but especially after 1989, I began to realize the impoverishing nature of this victim. Not only presumptuous and dismissive of human agency, but it was as monolithic as the Soviet foil. They both closed off the possibility of multiplicity. Now that we have passed the, uh, the centenary of the audacious experiment, I think it is worth trying to rescue this multiplicity and argue for the groundedness of divergence horizons of expectation. I wish I had not read Zygmunt Bauman and could conclude with my own words, but he expressed it best. So here is Zygmunt Bauman. The body of utopian criticism is bound to remain as before inherently fissiporous. Men climb, as it were, successive hills only to discover from their tops virgin territories which their, their never appeased spirit of transcendence urges them to explore. Beyond each successive hill, they hope to find peacefulness of the end. What they do find is the excitement of the beginning. Today is 2000 years ago, and he introduces the gospel, hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? So I'm ending my share here. Yes, thank you so much, I hope I... Oh, how can I... I think it can say, I can't turn on my video for some reason, but we'll see. Uh, thank you so much for this extremely rich uh, presentation um, with complete with archival and editorial stories. Um, we are now open for business, the business of question and answers. Um, and um, I, I and Lisa will uh, collect questions from the, um, from the chat section. I think that's the easiest. Um, but because you ended with Zygmunt Bauman, before we have those questions coming, I will sneak in one of my own, uh, which I think to some extent you addressed. Um, I remember him also talking, Zygmunt Bauman, about um, at the end of communism, the danger of living without alternative. And so I was wondering, it's, it's quite clear to us, um, you know, in what sense imagining the Balkans, which is still haunting you, was, was topical and politically relevant. But um, what do you think of the, the timeliness of this, of this work at a time when uh, our, you know, utopian horizons seem to have shrunk? And we do live uh, with, you know, we have the dangers of living without alternative to some extent. I mean, I was not sure, sure. as I told you, uh, I was not thinking of doing a book which would be adequate to the moment. Uh, I just saw these sources and I thought that this, this, this book wants to be written. Uh, and I had some personal reasons, of course, uh, but I don't think that there are not alternative. In fact, I finished my book uh, while I was in New York at the, uh, at the Remark Institute. And at that time, uh, Bernie Sanders was coming uh, on. And I was thinking, uh, in fact, my acknowledgements are ending that uh, I'm, I'm thanking the Remark Institute for housing me to finish my book. And I can call it, uh, I can call it Socialism on Fifth Avenue, which sounds like utopia, but, but why not? Uh, I think that actually meeting my students here, the American students, uh, socialism is very much alive in their thinking, obviously. So uh, there are alternatives. He, people are always, always hoping for something better, right? Uh, the interesting thing is that, of course, Kowakowski and uh, Bauman were involved in a, a huge debate about uh, utopia. But, but uh, as I said, uh, I didn't read it because I didn't have the time. But uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Bauman is very explicit. He's against utopia because he saw it in a very, uh, I'm sorry, not Bauman, uh, Kowakowski saw the utopia in a very rigid way. Uh, way is something which is doctrinaire and which is really uh, set about, but he opened the, the, the door for, uh, for socialism. Uh, and, and he also says, uh, and let, let me uh, read it to you, a movement that is worth trouble only as far as it is aware, not only of the complexity of problems 
hidden in each of these values separately, but also the fact that they limit each other and can be implemented only through compromises. So uh, it, uh, we cannot reach the state of perfection, which he says is utopia and it is dangerous because he sees it in it a, a kind of totalitarian uh, element. But uh, on the other hand, he says, uh, if, if it doesn't exist, then we are up to complete skepticism and, uh, uh, and uh, hopelessness. So uh, you have some kind of confluence there, although they come from very different uh, you know, positions, the two of them. Indeed, thank you for this. There are questions uh, that start trickling in. So we have one from Ivan Simic. Uh, thanking for the talk. I wondered if you had a chance to explore the experiences and hopes of women from Muslim backgrounds, namely from the Pomak or Turkish communities. Were there any within the socialist movements in Bulgaria? Uh, the, uh, I have not uh, encountered, first of all, women uh, in my database are 4% in the database. And of course, they are half of them are women because these women as i said were invisible so no the answer is no for for women the answer is almost no for uh for uh a, a pomak men i have not encountered there are some uh, uh turks uh, a very very few uh, uh turks in the in the movement we have now a, another question from um samuel foster uh, congratulating on the book. Uh, could Professor Todorova maybe discuss how the Bulgarian left perceived its relation with IMRO and Macedonia, given the irredentist associations? Um, a very complex uh, issue. So first of all, uh, uh, you, you have to keep in mind that Blagoev himself is a Macedonian Bulgarian. He comes from the village of Zagoricine, in which just by chance, uh, Angelima Bonova taught for, for, for a certain period. And uh, allegedly she wrote the letters of his parents to him while, while he was in uh, St. Uh, Petersburg. So, um, the, uh, so, so first of all, after 1903, you have two, two major formations in the uh, Bulgarian uh, social democratic uh, landscape, both of them recognized by the international, the so-called broads and the so-called narrows. The broads, uh, the broads uh, were um, for a uh, solution of the Macedonian question, which was through autonomy, whereas the narrows insisted on a federative principle. And the issue here is not simply the naming. Uh, autonomy was considered to be always a short shrift for a step to unification with Bulgaria, because the autonomy of, of Eastern Romania by 1882, uh, 1885 became uh, this union with Bulgaria. So the nationalists, the ones that were bitten, uh, bitten by the bug of nationalism, uh, were mostly among the broads, and they accepted this notion of, uh, of autonomy. Uh, the, the narrows were for the federative principle in which you would have a common federative republic, uh, within uh, within the Balkans, um, a very utopian vision, of course, um, no monarchies and and, and whatnot, and uh, the left wing of the Imro uh, were were sharing this view. In fact, the left wing of the Imro were also members of the usually narrow Bulgarian Social Democratic Party. You you can follow this type of uh, a coincidence of a double uh, of a double um, uh, membership. Their visions, of course, for this Balkan Federation uh, were uh, ambivalent. Uh, Blagoy, for example, was speaking of a Balkan Federation in which only European Turkey would participate. Others were speaking of a Balkan Federation in which the whole empire would uh, participate. But, but, but these, were, uh, these were visions which uh, coalesced, uh, especially around the uh, Young Turk Revolution, and of course were completely dead uh, uh, with, the, with the Balkan Wars and after World War I. Uh, thank you for this. Uh, I like how I'm vent relocking here, uh, all sorts of uh, former friends. And uh, so for a question from Harriet Murav. Ah. <laughs> You've shown how to make the allegedly peripheral matter. How does your work talk back to global preoccupations, distant reading, and other similar large scale studies? <laughs> well, <laughs> 
uh, I mean, socialism is a global thing, right? <laughs> So uh, the thing is, uh, I mean, in, in the book, I'm, I'm in fact uh, uh, pretty sarcastic about uh, uh, these uh, huge, some of them very talented and very fine, big surveys of global history. You have Ostra Hamel, you have the collective uh, uh, histories of the world, you know, global histories. You have, for example, 1600 pages in which only two pages are dedicated to socialism at the same time saying that socialism was the most powerful ideology next to nationalism in these two uh, in, in these two centuries which the book uh, uh, shares so uh, it, it is not simply excising uh, the peripheral it is excising really central issues because of the uh, because of the uh, fashions of the time uh, back to your first question, is socialism a, a, an alternative? Um, at this point, clearly in the, in the global uh, writing, um, uh, not. Um, so I think that uh, the, the most important thing here is uh, not to question the macroscopic uh, you know, approaches to, uh, to history, but to, ch to really change your perspective to change the, the lens through which you look, either through a, tel a telescope or uh, uh, through, uh, you know, closer up or through uh, a microscope. Uh, and, and, and this, of course, requires very, very different tools. And it, 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 uh, it uh, answers different questions, which doesn't mean that any of these approaches is privileged. It is the combination of, of all these approaches, which to me seem to give an approximation of uh, an uh, approximation to the complexity of reality. Uh, thank you. Uh, Dragan Plavsic, uh, another question. Do you think the idea of the Balkan Federation remains politically relevant today as a practical goal? If not, why not? If yes, how? <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> uh, I mean, practically at this point, I don't see it very uh, possible. Um, you know, my my one of my heroes, of course, is Blagoev, who is very well known. Very well known. He said, "In peripheral countries, for all the agency that we want to retrieve, uh, three we, we we depend three quarters on the outside, and only one quarter of, of, of ourselves. And uh, the three quarters, I think." are not very conducive to a Balkan Federation at this point. But uh, if it comes, I would be uh, marching in the first row. <laughs> uh, a very different question from Katarina Mravska, our former colleague. Uh, thanking you for the provocative lecture. I want to question about this. I, I, want to, I have a question about the status of images in your presentation. Do they also feature in your book or did you include them because of the nature of the PowerPoint presentation? As because my research focuses on images and their cognitive potential, but also their function as guarantor of truths. Right. So the images that I showed uh, are all in the book. Uh, I mean, this, this was my uh, you know, big uh, uh, discussion with uh, Bloomsbury and I'm very, very grateful. They allowed me 50 images. Uh, together with tables and all this. So they are all in the book. I have many more, obviously, uh, but, uh, and they did not allow me uh, colored images. Uh, some of them are in nice color, but at least, uh, yes, they are in the book. Um, Christiana Tanasov, um, can the roots and basis of socialism be traced back to the time of the Bulgarian revival? And were there any Balkan variants of socialism? Oh, absolutely. And uh, speaking of Balkan variants, I'm really happy to see Anka Mundru, who did this wonderful, wonderful dissertation on early uh, socialists in Romania, who predate, of course, uh, the socialist experience of the, uh, of the Bulgarians. The Bulgarians come in at the moment when Marxism is dominant, and they immediately embrace it. And here in, in Romania, you would have, the, you know, you have this stereotype about Romania that uh, they are really cleansed of uh, 
socialism. And it turns out they have uh, actually a robust and very impressive body of uh, uh, 19th century uh, socialists. Of course, they sink uh, by the 20th century. Uh, so yes, you do have it. In, in the Bulgarian case, uh, uh, the, the obvious example is Christobotev. And there, there is, of course, a, a huge debate in Bulgaria. Was he, uh, was he a communist? That he was a socialist, nobody can deny. The idea is, was he a communist? Because he, uh, he clearly uh, congratulated the Paris Commune, but uh, the, the so-called telegram, which he allegedly sent to the Commune, has been questioned because it appeared, uh, it appeared uh, rather, uh, rather late. But there is no question that he, he was in very, very close ties with, uh, uh, with uh, people also in, uh, um, uh, in, uh, in, in Western Europe, and not only uh, you know, uh, Nechaev, which is the usual uh, link that is uh, being ascribed to him. Uh, so uh, interesting enough, the first mention of, uh, of uh, socialism and co communism comes from a uh, center, if you like, a centrist, um, in in the in the uh, in 1871, you have the future exarch, who at that point was a student in in Paris, and he was describing he was describing the Paris Commune, uh, and he was uh, and even before that, 1848 is being described in this press, as and it is described in a in a tone which is uh, very objective. I mean, really, uh, pining for the for the demands of all these uh, people. Of course, these were not organized, uh, these were not organized uh, uh, socialists. So the first organization you would have uh, only by 1891, uh, the, you know, the creation of the Bulgarian uh, Social Democratic Party. But, but uh, as, as uh, uh, individual socialists, you would have them uh, already in, by the 1870s. Okay, one thing I did not anticipate is the difficulty of um, posed by all the Slavic names. I'll have to read, but Spasimir Tomaratsky from uh, Warsaw. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should have let people to ask their questions directly. Maybe it would have. How to reconcile the individual stories of socialist individuals with the subsequent Soviet type of communism that dominated Bulgaria? Did they have any impact on the nature of Bulgarian communism? after World War II, or can they be considered merely as a pre-World War II local peripheral folklore? Spassi, <laughs> whom I know very well, you have to read the book. All the answers are there. <laughs> no, but, but, but it, it is not a folklore. Uh, as I said, uh, this, uh, uh, this, this part of a Bulgarian social democracy was uh, actually uh, uh, very uh, significant and very influential in, uh, in, in the Bulgarian, uh, in Bulgarian history. Uh, it was completely decimated after 1925. I mean, virtually, I can show you, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, I want to save the time, but I can show you how many people were killed between 1923 and 1925 in what was a civil war in, uh, in Bulgaria. So this generation was completely decimated. Part of it uh, emigrated the, 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 to the Soviet Union and uh, part of it was also, uh, you know, killed off there or uh, returned. Now, uh, in the Bulgarian official uh, rendering of, of, of socialism, this period was seen as, yes, these are the predecessors, but they were not Bolshevized enough. So uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting uh, story that uh, so Bulgarian socialism was written by the second generation, which obviously wanted to emphasize its own uh, uh, contribution, the one of the interwar generations, and uh, was uh, sidelining uh, side uh, this uh, previous generation. And there are two things. The narrows were sidelined, side and there is a complete guilt of sidelining the, the so-called broads. So the broads were not even uh, not even written about during the uh, socialist period. Now, of course, uh, it is reversed. Now the broads are being, uh, you know, uh, lionized, and the narrows are pushed back. Uh, so again, these political perspe uh, perspectives uh, change. But no, I, I would say that uh, it is not a provincial thing. It is actually a, a very important uh, uh, element of this general. Uh, 
uh, general history of, uh, of uh, social democracy. Uh, and how to reconcile it with the Soviet thing. I mean, you reconcile everything in history, right? <laughs> Again, read the book. <laughs> Indeed, great message. Uh, from Hubert Kuberski, I'd like to ask you about Fanny Kaplan's absence in your book. She was a socialist revolutionist, a Serovsi, in pre-revolutionary Russia. She was a real uh -huh. utopist and she wanted to save humanity from Lenin's Bolshevik utopia. Why is this wonderful woman forgotten? And every, well, every well, she's not forgotten, but uh, here I see lots of my uh, Russian and Soviet colleagues, they should write about Fanny Kaplan. I'm writing about the periphery and she's the center. <laughs> Russia, Russia was still a center at that point. <laughs> Indeed, if, if within the Eastern European. Uh... <laughs> yeah, within the East European thing. Uh, and uh, to save it, I mean, again, uh, the, the attitude toward Lenin is not so uh, unilateral, right? Uh, a question from Ivana. I don't have a, fam a, a second name because of the, you know, some people sign up as guests. Have, so, you, have you come across any mention about dissemination of socialist ideas in the early 20th century Bosnia-Herzegovina under the Austrian-Hungarian rule? and the impact of these ideas on the work of the Mlada Bosna organization. I have not worked on that, uh, but, but definitely there was that. And, and in fact, in one of these pictures, the 1910 picture, they had delegates from the Bosnian social democratic par uh, social democracy, apart from the uh, Croats and the Slovenes who were participating in the Belgrade conference of 1910. So I have not worked on that. There is a longer question on the relation between socialism and nationalism from Sinisha oh. College, um, who wants to tackle this uh, link. Looking at Balkan history in the 19th century, it's safe to say that we see a history of antagonism between the Balkan people on the one side and the imperial powers on the other. Exceptions are made only when one of the powers uses one of the Balkan nations against another to fulfill its interest. When we combine this way of thinking with the fact that social divisions in the Balkans were not as deep as in Western Europe, is it possible to say that socialism in the Balkans was originally closely linked to nationalism with anti-imperialism as a common ground? And can we say that the Balkan nations were prone to a kind of left nationalism similar to what we see in Latin America and Arab states throughout the last couple of decades? Vetozar, Markovic, and early Serbian radicals could be an example. Uh, well, Svetozar Markovic comes early and he's very much uh, a child of the Narodniks, uh, very different from the, from the way the Romanians or the Bulgarian socialists were, uh, were, were coming through. I, uh, I think this is very utopian to, to hope that uh, the Balkan nations would have a kind of left-wing uh, nationalism. They prove that they have, uh, you know, a very poisonous nationalism when it comes to uh, nationalism. They are different nationalisms, of course. Uh, but but the, the relationship between socialism and nationalism is really very fundamental because we all live with this illusion and it is still uh, promulgated that you know socialism gave us so uh, uh, a short shrift to nationalism and didn't provide any kind of uh, uh, deep uh, considerations and this is actually untrue uh, what, what i was trying to do not in the talk but in the book at great length is to say that from the very outset the international was an international it was not international. It was really a nation-based society. It was uh, it was created around uh, around the nation states and around their uh, their uh, parties. And you you have it from the outset. You you have this uh, bickering uh, between the different uh, the national visions uh, of uh, of uh, uh, nationalism and of uh, <clears throat> of, of socialism. Uh, the internationalism was mostly in the rhetoric. When it came to praxis, uh, it was uh, actually a national, nationally based uh, uh, social, uh, socialism. Uh, the interesting thing is, of course, that in the uh, in the uh, deliberations of the uh, Second International, there are topics that predominated, and the topics were uh, orthodoxy versus revisionism, colonial issues. 
to which the Balkans didn't care, obviously, because uh, they were either didn't have colonies or, like in Bosnia, they were themselves a colony of another, uh, you know, of, of another empire, the Austro-Hungarian. So uh, these were the dominant issues, and of course, the issue of war and peace. Each time Balkan socialists would come together as, as, as you know, the Balkan federative idea appealing to the uh, international to take a stance uh, toward the Eastern question, the Macedonian question, they were shut down and they were saying, we don't want to meddle. To the point where it, there is one point after 1903, the, uh, the um, uh, breakdown of the uh, St. Elijah uh, uprising, when they are appealing again to the uh, international and it was only uh, the Spanish and the Czech uh, uh, representatives who were, gave a sympathetic ear. All the others were saying, this is murky territory. We don't know what is happening there. And the British uh, representatives said, this is a fight between two reactionary states, Russia and Turkey. And for me, Russia is worse. So it's essentially the, the position of the international was all the time to uphold the, uh, the Ottoman Empire for the sake of peace. At one point, Viktor Adler, who is it, of course, this, this great star of social democracy is talking to the Bulgarians and to the Serbs and he's saying, what do you want? We don't want to meddle in your affairs. All we are interested about is our proletariat. Do you want us to come in and solve your problems and get into a war? So uh, he was very defensive about his own proletariat as far as the Balkans would go. But then when 1914 happened, he was in the front lines calling on his proletariat, uh, proletariat to go and kill Serbs. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, all of this is wonderfully documented. Uh, a, a question that actually echoes some of my thoughts from our colleague Jakub Benesh about Bulgarian specificities. True, there were notable socialists in Romania, Serbia, and other Balkan countries, but Bulgaria seems to have provided extraordinarily fertile ground for leftist politics in the first half of the 20th century, from social democrats to communists to agrarian radicals. Why? Uh, well, I mean, it, uh, part of it is uh, social structure, part of it is the timing. So, uh, so for example, what happens in, in Serbia, you, uh, so the timing is you have the first international, you have the elevation of Marxism as a official doctrine by the second international, and it, it coincides with the formation of the Bulgarian independent states, 1878, right? So you have a cadre of young people who are uh, nationalists, and in this case, they are uh, you know, democratic nationalists be before nationalism was tamed. So in this sense, I would agree that uh, you, you have these uh, nationalists. They are very, very quickly disappointed and they embrace this doctrine. What do you have in Serbia? In Serbia, you have your uh, independence and you have a very strong radical party. So uh, within a space where you have already established political figures and political uh, parties and institutions, it is uh, more difficult to, uh, to uh, you know, channel and to, uh, to create another, uh, another important party. The same was true also for the Bulgarian party. The Bulgarian party was minuscule. It had uh, 3,000, 4,000, uh, at one point 6,000 people in, uh, when it was created in, in, the, in, in the 1890s. It really grew m massively uh, with, the, with the wars. So it reached really uh, an enormous uh, amount of, uh, of amount of uh, um, uh, support, uh, together with the agrarian party. Uh, so uh, part of that is because you you did have a more egalitarian society where not collectivism so much, but egalitarianism was something which was embraced, and also a society which which really was uh, very much focused on education, more so than in other parts. Uh, so uh, compare that also in the Greek case. You have an independent state and uh, a small, you know, rump independent uh, Greece from the 1830s on, 
with different parties which are filling out the space and the uh, and the uh, social democratic party comes fairly late in a space which is dominated by the irredenta so until the, uh, the the 1920s it's the megali there after the end of that of course you would you would have the embrace of this uh, uh, socialist idea and, and the founder, of course, of the Communist Party uh, of, of Greece is uh, Avram Benaroya, who is a Bulgarian Jew, right? B -b Born in Vidin and educated in Belgrade. So really a Balkan uh, guy who comes to, uh, to Saloniki and then creates this party. So I would say the combination of social structure and the moment in which they embrace these ideas. It's nothing more exceptional. The exceptional thing is, of course, after, this, after, the, uh, after my period, after the First World War, where, where the Bulgarians do indeed uh, uh, become disproportionately very uh, important in the Comintern in the Soviet Union. Why is that so? Because after 1923 and 2025, the civil war in Bulgaria, you would have uh, a huge emigration around 60 to 70,000 people, agrarians and, uh, and uh, communists. And obviously most of the communists in Western Europe, but they, most of them ended also uh, in the Soviet Union. And uh, proportionately, they were the biggest foreign element in the, uh, in, uh, in, in the Soviet Union in this interwar period. Um, in numbers, they were uh, smaller only to the Poles but of course, proportionately, they were the highest. So they, they played a, 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 a unsized, uh, um, upsized role in, uh, in, in this interwar period. So I don't think that uh, Bulgarians have necessarily a kind of uh, lefty genes, although I wish they did. Uh, a question from Rosan Diagalov. Uh, thank you for, you for the fantastic and much needed book. Needless to say, Marxism in Bulgaria and the Balkans was a foreign import from Western Europe, Russia. But did the generation you study make any original contribution to socialist thought to the core? Uh, so, of, of course, uh, I mean, I, I'm dealing with that. The, 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 I would say the only original thing would be uh, this notion of Balkan Federation, which was picked up from uh, from before, but then it it, it got this uh, uh, socialist, uh, uh, you know, cosmetics around it. That's the only original thing I would say. Otherwise, it was, uh, of course, uh, the transfer of uh, ideas. And uh, uh, what I'm suggesting is, of course, why would it be a transfer of ideas? It is a République des Lettres, right? a socialist republic of letters. All people are participating uh, and, and they're being, bringing it down uh, through uh, through this kind of uh, 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 vulgarization, if you like, so that people will would understand, uh, you know, the prose of, uh, of 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 Marx and the uh, and the rest. Um, so uh, yes, they were mostly. Uh, how was Marx translated? For example, Marx was translated from Russian in two editions. It was the first. First of all, Marx was translated in any other foreign language first in Russia. Uh, and from Russian, it was translated into Bulgarian in two editions, but it was so meticulously always uh, compared to the German and to the French editions, which, which Engels uh, edited. So it was actually a multi-layered translation. Um, beyond that, um, uh, so it, it's the reception of Marxist ideas, I would say, but this is true for most anywhere. So the, the, one, the one original thing in the uh, Austro-Hungarian context is of course, Austro-Marxism, which is very sophisticated and very wonderful, but it is different from the, uh, from the uh, Balkan Federation. And the, uh, and the um, thing with the Balkan Federation is that whenever it is mentioned in Western surveys, they say that the Balkans embraced the idea of Balkan Federation created by Kautsky. And what I'm trying to disentangle, and I show it, I hope, convincingly, is that Kautsky wrote uh, an introduction to the Bulgarian translation of his work on, on France. And in this introduction, he wrote uh, the tasks of uh, social democracy to the undeveloped 
to the social democracy in the undeveloped countries of Europe. And there he innovated this idea of the uh, Balkan Federation. He was fed, he was fed with literature essentially by ghostwriters, Bulgarian ghostwriters who gave him this thing, uh, who wrote his introduction de facto. And so his, his big, uh, um, uh, you know, the big uh, uh, effort uh, of, uh, of Kautsky is that he sanctioned the idea which had been already uh, you know, circulating and being published in, uh, in, uh, uh, in books. So for example, the idea of a common customs union which was, in fact, of course, elevated again uh, in 1948 uh, between uh, between uh, Tito and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Tito and Dimitrov, and of course, come down, down by by Stalin. This was based on this idea of a first customs union and then creating a federation. So it, it predates, of course, the the creation of the European Union in some ways, beginning with a customs union. So the, 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 that's as far as it goes uh, with originality. Um, most, of, uh, most of the other things were just consumed. This has been a marathon. We have one more question. I don't know if you uh, have uh, energy for this one. That's also, um, I think it touches on a couple of things that came up before. Denny Pencheva, would you say that your book is contributing towards the decolonization of socialist studies? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so, yes, I think there are just lots of uh, thanks and um, <laughs> interest in reading the book. So I think we've, um, <laughs> we've, we've actually covered quite a lot in terms of questions as well. Um, thank you so much. I think uh, it's great we, we will have a recording of this. Uh, because it's been quite rich. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much. It's, it's such a pleasure to see so many names and faces. <laughs> Indeed, I saw Anka as well, and I'm glad you mentioned that. And, and Anka, I mean, the, the two of them are mentioned in my acknowledgements because they were really the, the motor for the quantitative <laughs> parts of the book. <laughs> Great, thank you all so much. I think we will uh, end here. and. Um, we will uh, come back with a recording at some point, I guess.